Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from... My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, we are speaking to writer, blogger, and fellow Australia-based occultist Julio Cesar Oddi about growing up weird in Brazil, discovering magic, and the state of the occult world today. Good times. Julio, thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So we've been chatting a little bit uh, on Twitter, so I'm quite looking forward to the uh, the traditional first question, Julio. Were you a weird kid? Oh, man. I'm pretty sure a lot of people think about the answer to that question these days in case they have to talk to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, think, I think I wasn't that weird until, until things got really weird and it was sudden in my life i think because interesting because you invited me here to talk about spiritism and and mainly and i think that that had everything to do with it and uh, so everything began with a sense and then things got very strange the house and they forever got they stayed strange so i'm still a weird kid now well thanks to to that initial experience (laughs) But, so yeah. <laughs> tell us more about that. Was that a seance that uh, you did the, the classic young child thing of having a seance when maybe you shouldn't, or was that someone else in the house? Because obviously, if we're talking about growing up in Brazil, there's a different categorization for weird um, yeah. because there is you know, a, a sort of estimated 20% on the regular use of uh, or experience of spiritism regardless of uh, of of traditions in brazil growing up so there's a big chunk of people that are already a lot of brazilians are weird kids put it that way <laughs> yeah it's true uh well uh, no it was the former actually like i did um we call it senses in brazil more commonly than not are done with a glass so they turn a glass upside down on a table that's soft enough so it can actually slide around and um so you do cut ups of letters in a circle and then the glass moves to the letters. Then you know somebody writes down whatever is being said. That's more or less a format that happens, and uh, and it's a pretty common format that kids talk about it. So in high school, like growing up, even as a kid, people would say "jogo do copo," which is uh, translates to cups game or the game of the cup or something like that. So we um, so a couple of friends and I decided to do it, and then we got together one fine day and uh, in an afternoon in my house, and we just close the doors to this room and then we laid it out and, and did it. And I mean, we did it for three days in a row and the first day, nothing, absolutely nothing happened. And we stayed there for hours. So we're pretty persistent as far as kids go. But with the second day, uh, things start, like the cops started moving and we were pretty sure that we were not like fucking about, like we're not, can I swear by the way? Yeah. Right. Swear, swear all you want. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, so we're not, you know, we're not screwing around where we, we noticed that, and it was moving pretty fast, as in the to the point that we were actually chasing the cop mm. and not the other way around. And then the third day, things got really, really, really uh, interesting. And to a point that we, like the, the spirit or the manifestation, told us to take our hands off the cop, and then the cop moved by itself. And it was interesting because right when that happened, uh, my um, we had a maid working in the house, which is a really common thing in South America. And and she opened the door and she saw it just as that happened and then she screamed and she ran out and then my father came over and then he looked around and he witnessed it as well a bit and then he just like he had the most weird response to the phenomenon that, that i could think of because i just saw it for a bit stared at it for a few seconds and said just keep the door closed and then closed it and left <laughs> so yeah so it's really strange because yeah, but but we uh, what came from that was that um, I developed a crazy attachment to the whole thing because I realized that there had to be a method to replicate that. And the other two kids, they, they went home and they told their parents, and their parents called my mom really upset, said, don't ever fucking do that again, and we're never sending them over again, and that kind of thing. But the, that manifestation stuck around with me for a long time. Well, was, I was going to say, you don't need human friends after that, so they can go fuck themselves. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, but, you know, that that more or less happened. Like, we, we, we sort of ceased to be friends, those two, those other two guys. And, I mean, no, I don't think they wanted to, but they must have gotten an earful at home. And But I, I didn't give up. And, and, and I was the one that ended up, say, plagued by the manifestation because he didn't leave and then started 
appearing and, and things started happening in the house and then my parents got involved and in Brazil you have this thing called a benzedera which is a uh, often somebody who comes over to do cleanse in the house and they often practitioners of Fumbanda or something along those lines or just somebody of faith, you know, so we don't have this taxonomy that well delineated in Brazil. It's not that well, you know, they, they both blurs together one thing with the other. And so we had this Benzadera come over and she, she told my mom, oh, uh, it's, it's, it's in him. So I can even actually do the cleansing for you, but it's not going to really help you because he's going to bring it back. So um, I'll do it. And my mom said, no, I'll do it. I don't care. And then she did <laughs> because it was getting ugly, to be honest. And then, yeah. and then she, so she did the cleansing. But then, you know, as she said, it did come back. And then I started getting taken to places and spiritist centers and whatnot for them to fix it. Because my mom figured that you had to fix it. So, yeah. So um, was it the same? Obviously, nothing happened on the first day. Was it the same spirit day two and day three? I mean, uh, or was it because if... if with the benefit of hindsight, after you know a couple of decades of, of magical practice, you kind of look back on youthful experiences and go, "Well, I probably didn't set that up right." And so, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, was it one thing that stuck around, or did you end up just kind of attracting stuff? Uh, no, um, no, various things. In the, the the first day, nothing happened. As I said, the second day, a few different things and just just gibberish what was happening a lot in the beginning but then uh one particular spirit that identifies itself as oval which translates as egg it's really interesting how they often give you names that don't like mm -hmm. they're not likely names if you think about humans and that kind of thing but so he said that the name was oval and then but that one stuck around and the third day was the same one so the same spirit came and said the same name and said the same things that it had said the day before and and yeah so it was the same, but but you're right. Like we didn't do a great setup, but but to be honest with you, I tend to think these days that the tech involved for doing that kind of thing is really that simple. Like mm. it really, it may take persistence because the barriers that you're breaking, they have a lot more to do with breaking the routines of the spirits themselves and not us per se. I mean, there may be there are skills and things you can do, right? You can develop skills. You can do a setup. Of course, it helps, but. But what I'm saying is that there's another side to the equation. There are other variables to it. So it can really work being that simple. No, absolutely. So tell us a bit about where uh, where your mother took you to try and get you washed off. Yeah. Uh, I th timelines, I can't quite remember. Like we went to a spiritist center. So that's the thing about like, you know, tying spiritism a bit into this. Uh, nearly every time Brazil has the spiritist centers, right, they – that they're houses that they rent and then people come in and they survive on donations most of the time, as far as I know, or sell books and things. But, um, but people come in and get, you get passi, which is like a magnetism sort of thing. They, they'll, they'll put their hands around you like that. So similar to Reiki, but not quite the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the mediums will do that. And at the same time, they also hold their own senses, but they have a method. So they're not just like, like we did, you know, they have a method and they have people who are clairvoyant or, or our mediums you know, who can embody the spirits and whatnot. So, so uh, my mom took me to one of those places, and then uh, so the mediums there uh, said, uh, "Well, it's because uh, that's the view that the spiritist has. They don't see demons, they don't see angels, they don't see these things. They see all humans. Hmm. So with different levels of evolution or devolution, and uh, and they said it's um it's an unevolved spirit that wants to attach to, like attach to your son and that's that's it right so they simplify everything even though the spirit had said some really i mean now in hindsight some very evolved things along the lines of black magic and he knew about he knew about the book of saint Cyprian, for instance and he, he told me to go after it and he told me that's that's the thing you should do and that's the thing you're going to find your spiritual path in it i mean it wasn't that clear but he told me just go there and do those things and then you'll see and but they as far as they were concerned this is all really part of being unevolved right mm. doing black magic is the thing that you do if you're not evolved and whatnot so she took me there but then she actually took me to um a really famous umbanda uh practitioner in uh, in a town about five hours away from where we lived and then so she was the one that actually banished the spirit properly and she had to do a big work for that but and she was pretty adamant as well because she embodied one of uh, like a an elderly African lady, and she and the 
and that spirit said, you can't handle that shit now. Like if you, if you work this now, you will destroy you and you will consume your life. You will do a whole bunch of bad things. And so you got to let me banish it. So, so, but, but that happened throughout days of her negotiating. Let me do it. Cause I didn't want to, I, did, I was finding all that too great. Right? Mm-hmm. I didn't want to let them do it. So I think that's when he ended, but I've been to a few spiritual centers. And then after the banishing, I kept coming back to them and, and, and trying to learn more and more. From the Umbanda house that's five hours from where you lived, or just uh, in general? Yeah, uh, no, in general, more about the spiritists, actually, because um, for whatever reason, I think I may have mentioned it to you, like Umbanda and Kimbanda never really interested me when I was over there. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the practices, but I really just figured that when that black magic slash European magic kind of got dropped in my life. I pretty much found my love for that time. And yep. I wanted to go for that. and didn't want to go for the local stuff. It just never really impressed me. But it wasn't quite the modus operandi that I wanted to, to be involved with. But um, no, I, I went back to some Umbanda houses. A few years later, I got I actually initiated into Umbanda. But I never developed that because I couldn't feel a passion for it. I just mm-hmm. more or less went because I figured, you know, it's the thing that's right here, so I may as well do it. So I didn't have yeah. a good reason for it. But Spiritist Houses, yes, I stayed involved with them for a good five years of regular going back and then seeing the census sections and, and participating and whatnot. Well, so Brazil has a kind of umbrella term, uh, Espiritismo, for the kind of... Uh, that that umbrella term for uh, candomblé and umbanda and 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 the influence of spiritism anyway. So would you kind of say, well, I guess I was exploring spiritismo as a local term rather than I'm particularly yeah. interested in the works of Alan Kardec and and all that kind of thing. It was more, I, um, yeah. I wasn't at all interested in his works, to be honest. And I think a lot of houses of spiritism are not either mm. because the, he he's very adamant about certain things and and a lot of um, and that's how it goes. I think a lot of people who read books on magic and participating forums these days, they think it's all a big monolith. Mm-hmm. They think it's all, you know, that there's this order of belief and there isn't really like, if you go back to Brazil, you're going to find, um, spiritism looks, sees in a negative light, Kimbanda obviously, and he sees Umbanda as well in a negative light because he considers the African spirits to be less evolved. And it's yep. really just the way I'm saying here, really. Yep. So, but that, of course, doesn't apply to every house. Some houses will see them like that. Some houses will be open to them. And, and so, you know, there, there's really no order. And, and you're right. There, it is this umbrella term. And, and it is with this vast, say, range of things in Brazil that I was trying to get involved with. But mainly I was interested in the metaphysics of it. I was more, I wanted to see what the spirits had to say. I wanted to understand how it was, how, how was on the other side and and how do we reach them? How exactly does this work, right? And that that's and because they seem to have that really well nailed. And, and well, they had that they was, had repeated successes with doing that, which which interested me. Well, I think that's uh, and I, I kind of this is going to be the next question because if you look at um, Alan Kardec's life and if you look at the the books he subsequently wrote, there. Um, he was kind of trying to solve the same thing that interested you. So whatever happened out of that, like doing all the the research in Paris on on the different mediums that were um, that could verify re- results for him, and kind of putting together this book, which is a very narrow metaphysical view of the world with a lot of problems, as you say. But at the at the heart of, of Kardec was like, well, hang on, this stuff appears to be real let's let's see where that goes and I, I i guess i wanted to preface with that to say why is why did alan kardec's works so this sort of um french civil servant writing under a pseudonym wandering around paris uh investigating all the mediums that were operating and turning it into some fairly some very kind of 19th century style books to do with reincarnate very um, you can tell it comes from the same time as Blavatsky, right? Yeah. Uh, why? Why did that take off in Brazil? Yeah, there is. There's a good essay by, I think he published it now in a book. I don't know which book to be honest, but um, Umberto Maggi actually wrote a good essay on the origins of, um, say, the French influence, the French occultist influence in Brazil. But there is a more social level to that, which is the fact that the French elite really, as he says, was indeed the model for the Brazilian elite. Mm-hmm. 
So everybody wanted to be French, everybody wanted to speak French and to do the French things. And amongst that was spiritism. And, and they inherited, so, you know, the, the spiritist and the senses and all the stuff that used to be common in Paris, I believe, at the time. And, and, and that's what shaped the landscape. I think it's really just a cultural thing that came over from, from Europe. It's simple as that. And it's a thing about, say, if they do it and it's an acceptable uh, spiritual practice there, then you ought to be here as well. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that kind of makes sense, that last point. But uh, what... What interests me, and I kind of mentioned this to, um, I think it was Conjurman Ali when he was talking about his Brazilian experiences. Uh, mm. Julio, why is this one particular country creating and exporting, uh, like, essentially world religions at a, a fairly fast rate? I mean, they're young, but it's quite clear that um, they're going to be quite widespread over the next couple of centuries. Why is that the same place that has really good ufo encounters and and all the other stuff what is it in the water in brazil <laughs> that uh that has had all this uh yeah my my experience i think is restricted with magical places like i mean I, I know a town that is a very favorable place for say things happening and it's where most of my spiritual life unfolded and i think brazil is known like we hear from other people who travel to place certain places in brazil who are said to be magical there's there's a big new age place called Alto Paraíso, which translates to High Paradise, and they, that, that's a really, really big destination there for it. I'm, I'm certain there are other places, Bahia, for instance, which is where the bigger, like the core from Banda and Kimbanda is, is said to be full of those places. Now, what explains that? I'm not sure. Maybe when the whole heaven and hell thing happened, a few things were buried in there. I don't know. But yeah, well, but, it, it's, but it, it seems odd to me. You know, it's if you look yeah. at the. If you look at the um, former colonies of European empires, one of them has some of the biggest, best, and scariest UFO incidences, particularly in the 70s, and they still regularly happen. It's also exporting spirit-based world religions uh, around the world, and, and it has a um, a regular or a widespread undercurrent of different ways of encountering the spirit world. And... Uh, you know, there are naturally occurring entheogens. Uh, it, it just seems that Brazil gets... There's something Dr. Skinner said about Egypt in, in the classical world. The classical world believed that when God was divvying up magic, um, mm -hmm. you know, Egypt got essentially three quarters of it and the rest of the world had to share the, for the final quarter. It seems like in the new world, Brazil got three quarters of it. Yeah. Well, I think that also there's another element to it, which is the... The highly pragmatic approach, I think, to to magic and the occult, like they, people tend to think that it's all a bunch of superstitious people who are not very well educated, and that's why, like you know, they believe in a lot of stuff, but it's not quite true. Like you, the, um, there's an expectation of success and repeated repeatable success of any given practitioner, no matter what you do there. And people get very much like and when they spot that, they get very much attached to it and they tell their friends and whatnot. And it isn't likely, I agree with you, because it's a highly Christian slash evangelical place. Like they, they, it, it's in general, it's Abrahamic, but and which goes directly against all these doctrines, obviously. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of people who you see in Banda houses, in spiritist centers and whatnot, they still go to the church. Yeah. And, they pretend it's all all good, right? It's not all good. Obviously, the priests sometimes they they will be quite outspoken against it, but but they you still see it, and I think people feel this draw there, like because you find a practitioner, you find somebody of renown, and there's this open. Oh, okay, so there's there's something I can actually blame for all that. There's an open format to these houses, which is if you're if you're nobody, right? You don't even know it. You can come in and watch it, and you can. You know, depending on what happens, you can participate. If you come in a few times, of course, some houses are pretty secretive, but by and large, it's not difficult for you to to find a house that will have you mm -hmm. to see it, right? Which is, I think, something that makes a big difference because if you're just really curious, you can go and experience something, right? Yeah. So there's, there, are, there are very open pathways to people who are a bit interested in it to kind of go and see, okay, this is real. It's interesting. I want to pick up on something you said because uh, it hadn't occurred to me, but I think you're correct that if there is a cultural rigor so that if it uh, – if people can replicate results, if they can um, get good messages that can be verified and so on through, then it's doubled down on and, and spread out. That 
that kind of piece is 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 missing in uh in a lot of other cultures so that it, it, particularly anglo american cultures where basically anyone can open a crystal shop um it it's not quite the same if if there is an expectation that if you if you want to play in this world you actually have to deliver results yeah it's true um i mean i respect that some people want to be secretive about things it's their it's their choice but um if you if you go to an umbana house or if you go to a spiritual center or a kimbana house as well they're more rare though but if you go to these places uh the work that's being done the actual magic is done right in front of you so nobody like if you wanted to write down the rituals and go and do it yourself you could and there's nothing stopping you from doing that if you especially if you attend throughout a year you're obviously mm. going to pick up on a lot of stuff and you could go back and if you're a good anthropologist you can write a great book on that several people have done that in fact you know in the caribbean with the with the baptist tradition and whatnot so so it happens uh but i i i think that this format like it, it's at least my personal gauge for being good at magic is that mm-hmm. like if you're really good you can do it in front of other evil like you see yeah. <laughs> you know and, and it's a hard it's a big it's a big statement i agree i know that but but I, I, after seeing for so many years people doing that all the time there that's still what i aim for you know <laughs> personally in my practice oh, well speaking of practice uh so once Egg left the first time, uh, and having mentioned the Book of St. Cyprian and so on, let's pick up your journey. I mean, when did you actually, um, when did you find that kind of Western European inflected um, version of magic? Did you go through what a lot of people did, which is, and we've mentioned this before, like maybe picking up one or two books that people shouldn't maybe see on your bookshelves and on the journey towards finding the real thing? I mean, let, let's go back to... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Julio the Kid and that magical journey. <laughs> well, um, yeah, the Book of St. Cyprian was a big influence because I, I did spend, like I said, I was talking about that town that I consider to be a magical place. I'm actually, like, I have an unfinished essay about that town that I should publish at some point that explains part of the things that were seen there and people's lives and their relationship with the folk magic that goes on there. I have a whole bunch of finishing essays, so <laughs> shame on me. <laughs> but, but, but that's one of them. But, but yeah, um, so that place is where a lot of the experience with the Book of St. Cyprian took place, and a lot of really weird things happened there. And, and I mean, the, the, the reason why that was a more attractive choice is because it, re- because it responded very fast. So it's not, it wasn't so much a case of me looking at a big menu of, of types of magic because there was no such thing. There was no internet and the mm. publications in Portuguese were somewhat restricted. I hadn't yet learned English. So that all happened when I was still 12 years old or 13 or thereabouts. So I was limited to, to Portuguese. But, uh, so yeah, I mean, I worked with that book and I ran experiments and I mean, we, we saw ghosts and we saw talking animals. We saw stuff that was downright crazy. And then we had, we started running a friend of mine and I in a hotel that my father ran as a side business in this town. So I spent a lot of time there. We started running seances there and then the people who worked at the hotel started attending to the seances more and more. And, and that's when, I mean, that, that, that time shaped a lot of the views that I still have about the occult and, and what's real, what not. They, I remember, um, was one case of a mate that, she started talking in like at, at the air basically like but she was just sitting there watching really the whole thing and then she started talking at the air and and the cop started responding to what she was saying over there and then uh, later we asked so what happened there she goes now we like i mean my family we see spirits it's pretty normal but nobody really makes a big deal out of it but she was really just, just quiet about it she didn't, didn't really think much and and it's interesting how that kind of thing happens there, but people just like nobody actually made a subject or a topic out of it. But I remember that was my first encounter of actually seeing power that comes with birth and that kind of thing mm-hmm. that it just had that ability. Essentially, there's no good explanation for it, or maybe there is, but nobody knew. But well, I carried on with the book of Saint Cyprian for a long time, and I started. Uh, my main interest was in demons, and mm-hmm. it still is, to be honest. But I'd never have guessed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, yeah, it still is, but it, it, which was, I think that interest is what pushed me away from spiritism because they don't even believe in demons in the first place. Yeah. And they think it's all humans, and I was at the time quite certain that that wasn't the case, having seen a few things. 
Yeah, so, that's um, the the its eternal shortcoming with Anand Kardec is that I, I approve of his use of data and essentially spreadsheeting the um, the mediums of Paris, but he only looked at one data set. He only looked at that kind of piece, and so we sort of overinterpreting from it. But uh, yeah, I agree completely. So that's interesting because you had um, so you essentially went against in a funny way, what the um, old African Umbanda spirit said, which is, don't mess around with the Book of St. Cyprian yet or it'll destroy you. So you went home and bought a copy? Is that essentially what uh, happened? <laughs> no, I had a break from it. I had a okay. big break from it. So, so for a long time, I started going to just the spiritual centers. And, and I mean, long time. I mean, it, it feels like a long time because it was very intense. I started doing pretty much nothing else other than mm-hmm. really going there all the time. So it's fair to say that it wasn't a long time, but it was an intense time. But but um, no, I, I, a while later I went back to it, and, and it, it, it kind of snuck back in a few of uh, Eliphaz Levi, Levi or Levi books, mm-hmm. like they snuck in as well, and they were impressive. I mean, I don't find them impressive at all these days, but they were impressive at the time, and I think this this kind of magic snuck back in. Crowley stuff did not didn't become present till much later in my life, mm-hmm. and it's not at all present nowadays. But but it had a piece. But um, no, so well, I bought the book of Saint Cyprian again many years later. But then I approached with a different mind. I think she left. She left something there. She left like this, this idea in my head that it could be dangerous, and and I think I spent a lot of time underestimating that because mm-hmm. I tend to do that a lot. I still do it. Like a lot of things that I receive these days, practices from people, and now they say it's dangerous. I'll go and do it, and I'll let it explode, and then I yeah. go okay. They're right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, I think it's the best way to do this kind of thing. But yeah, no, don't know if I answer, if I answer your question or not. No, it's good, because I'm just trying to get the sequence from... Uh, it, so after the sort of um, hotel seance period... Uh, was that? I mean, was that just before you emigrated, or I mean, where where do, where do we pick up the the magic rest of Julio's life story from from there? Yeah, no, look, there was a long time that I actually I, I knew I knew it all existed. I knew those things were real, but I didn't actually do anything about it. So when I came to Australia, I was very focused on my work and and career and whatnot. So which was really good to be honest. That was very that helped me set myself up here and. And which which eventually paved the way to the spiritual happening. So it was important, I think, to be away from it completely, as I was. I mean, I was still doing the odd astral projection, mm-hmm. and I mean, I could do it very well when I was young, but then I kind of lost the practice, and then it became more difficult as I grew up. But I was still trying to every time, and then getting some effects and whatnot. But but yeah, that that, that sprinkled in for a long time after I moved to Australia. I moved to Australia when I was twenty four, twenty three. So I'm thirty. Five now. I don't even know my Asian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I moved I moved here and then this wasn't in the picture for a long time. And actually um the the renaissance of of my spiritual life was came a few years later when it, when it when it came with the fury and it took down my career and it took down a whole bunch of things actually. And and then I remember that, you know, I was pretty much my career was in shambles. There was nothing else I could do. I thought I may as well, I don't know what I'll do. I may as well go back or something. I don't know what I'll do. Like I'll do something else entirely. And my now wife, she took me to this uh, cartomancer. Like we're walking past this new age shop. So it's the last place you catch me in, like swear to God, like you will never see me in there. <laughs> she goes, oh, we should go get a reading. It's 15 bucks. And I go, no fucking way. Cause no, I don't even know this person. Don't trust them. Don't yeah. like, no. But she goes, no, we should go. So we went in, and then that person pretty much read the cards a bit and, and just put the deck aside and said to me, listen, you you got to go back to doing magic. And when you do it, then everything that you're going through now is going to solve itself. And then she handed me a book, which is not exactly the kind of book I like even to brag about, but she gave me a book, and then I did that thing, and then everything went back to normal, and it became great, actually, much better than before. Nice. Well, the, the whirlwind tour. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. So, um, yeah. I guess what were the pieces? Uh, I'm just trying to work out um, yeah. how you. Um, I, I mean, how did you end up where you are like, f- from a magical practice perspective? So there was um, the kind of uh, young Julio in Brazil um, seance period. There was the time in the wilderness slash Australia, and I fully get that. <laughs> and. Uh, and then there was the kind of return to magic. So let's talk about the return to magic. Yeah, uh, well, the return to magic happened, and that's when Thelema and, and Crowley stuff became very relevant. And that's 
it's just the sort of thing that when I was young, and in Brazil, Crowley had a really bad name. Like he had a bad name as a black magician. and whatnot. It's, it's hilarious thinking about that these days, but he really has that reputation there. When it's funny because some people are actually working with Kimbanda or or even the book of St. Cyprian, but they're horrified of Crowley. Yeah. So, so they got yeah. not to be afraid of. So, so, but, not at all. But that, but that was the case back then, for at least for where, where I was. But uh, but then, so Thelema got came into my life and more or less from the experience that I got from the book that that cartomancer gave me. And, uh, and they were, it was really effective. I mean, the first operation that I did was the shabbiest thing you could possibly think of, but it was amazing anyway. So like it was fully visionary and it was the, the whole shebang and it took me many, many months even after I actually had a really good setup to be able to replicate anything like that. But I think it was, I was talking to Jake Stratton Kent in New York about that experience. And I told him, look, I don't actually have a good explanation. I think there was something there waiting to happen. And that's why it happened the way it did. Mm. And I was surprised to find him to be agreeable about that. He pretty much said, oh, that's pretty much how it goes. And I'm like, okay, good. Because I thought I was going to be, you know, <laughs> get some scorn from you. Because it was seriously, it was like the, the shittiest setup you could possibly think of. And it still worked amazingly. Well, I, I think the analysis is quite correct, especially if it, when you were talking about walking by the New Age store. Uh, it, I, I get the impression it's kind of like when you walk past a phone booth and it rings, like you were just they're trying to get, you know, hello, remember us, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah, pretty much. Like a, uh, it, it did work and I started trying to find people around here in Australia. So I joined the OTO and mostly because I started Googling what kind of societies and, and, and that kind of thing were, was available. And I, I was really pleased at the time. I thought the OTO was, oh, my God, these guys do magic. They're wizards. They'll, mm. you know, hopefully they will have me. I know. Like, I, know I can hear myself as I'm telling you that. Yeah. But <laughs> you know, that's the honest version of what happened. And then I joined them. And to be honest, it was really important because I actually, tur- as it turned out, I did meet people who were doing actual magic in in the OTO, it was one gentleman who was in it, who was, everybody else, I mean, I hope they're not listening to this, they probably will, but nobody else was really that much into it, but that guy was, and he kind of saw my interest, and he kind of took me in, and he said, no, look, I'll give you some tips, and this is how you do the rituals, and this is what you do, and I did what he said, and I had good results, and then he eventually led me to his teacher, who was a magister template of the AA, and I studied with that man for a year and a bit. So, and, uh, and I still praise the yoga that I got from him because he was very good at that and he was very good at teaching it. And I was very disciplined to actually do it every day, multiple times a day. Like I was having serious hours of every day being devoted to it. And I actually, my, tr- my main trance technique these days is still based on yoga and, mm-hmm. and being very still in Nazana. So yeah, that was the, the bridging period. That was the beginning of the Renaissance. But I think as the... As the whole demons thing started happening, the return to the origins of black magic started setting in more and more. And then at some point, I pretty much divorced from Thelema completely because I figured out that I could actually do the rites as I understood them. And by actually studying cosmology better than I could do with Thelema. And that's when I actually managed to replicate the first results that I got. Uh, there only- you go. Yeah. So, yeah. You have to learn and unlearn. It's very, it's like painting a yeah. fence in a movie. Yeah. True. Yeah. So, um, I mean, how did you, because now I guess you would probably be described more in, as, as a grimoireist or, or so on. Yeah. So once you, once you're like, okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Thelema. Thank you for introducing people who actually do practice magic, maybe not in this exact system, but to the side of it, then it was, um, then you kind of found the bowl of porridge that was just right. Yeah, no, it's, it, I think mainly it's because I started to, I was running these experiences so often, and it was really good. I mean, I to, it wasn't good in that way, but my wife, she used to work weekends at the time, so I had the house for myself for long periods of time, and I, I was doing them very often, and I I think because I'm a software developer as well, I, I tend to start looking for bugs in anything, and that's what happened. I started looking at that method and going, there's a problem in that, there's a problem in that, there's probably a problem in that. And then I started looking at the grimoires as, because grimoires are really written very um, adamantly, as in they're very certain about what they're saying. Yeah. And they're very, oh, this is how you do it. And that is, that's exactly what you should see. That mentality kind of married 
to mine, but even though I came to discover that, I don't think it's quite like that. But, but you know, now nevertheless, I, I still agree with the mindset. I actually found, I started to meet, or not meet, but I started to get to know from Facebook and whatnot, the grimoirists, and I found that their mindset agree with mine too, because they were very technical about the whole thing. And it's something that helped very much get somewhere and improve with that. So, so um, yeah, I started more or less trying to follow what the Gumar said and, and, and I, I pursued quite seriously the key Solomon and the gear. So I pretty much caught everything down to the very fine lines of it and started following the rituals exactly as, I mean, it matters is key, right? So it's not quite reliable, but mm. it's reliable enough, I believe, for you to do Grimoire magic. And then things turned very amazing. That time was really important, even though what I do these days is not, it's not at all Christian, not at all Abrahamic, but but it is. It was really important and led me to great places. Like the the, op- the operations were very impressive. And, so and that, that, my, the next question was going to be, uh, what was your what was the first and what's your like maybe emotional favorite, emotionally favorite grimoire, like your pet grimoire. So the first uh, one was Mother's Key, presumably that you worked yeah. diligently, and then what's the one that you're like, no, oh, I like that one the best. <laughs> I, I, I hate them all, kind of these days. So I hate them all because I have to say I hate them all because they say shit that that's not exactly conducive for you to actually do in the work. You know, yeah. As 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 crazy as it sounds, like I think they. They could use more objectivity when saying certain things, and it tends to be the way I write. When I write things, I try to be as objective as possible. I keep reading them, those books, and going, "No, but it's you know." But, but anyway, I think the Higramantia is probably the one I would commend, and mostly yeah. because I, I say that because I think this is more flexible than it seems. I think that that, that setup of saying you do this preparation here, you talk to the plants a bit, you get their license to operate. And then you start the operation and then you call for spirits in the name of these superiors here. Yep. And then something is going to come up that tends to be very conducive for you to get in somewhere as opposed to, yeah, <laughs> that, that one. So it tends to be very conducive for you to get in somewhere quick and effectively. And to be honest with you, I think that's what the first thing you should do. Because when you try to, when you aim for a spirit, there's a whole lot of barriers in and potential disagreement between the spirit and yourself that you may not be aware of. Yep. And you may be really trying to get through the brick wall with, with punches and get the impression that the problem is the work you're doing, but it's not. It's just the spirit and you and perhaps the geography even, which I tend to be a big believer of these days, that geography influences a lot in that kind of magic. Um, but... Yeah, so the Higromantia is the one I would say for that reason. The key actually kind of, like, the key works that way too. It is a bit more strictly um, Christian, or sorry, Judeo Christian, but um, but the Higromantia is my, yeah, it's yeah, my it's more favorite. Mine too. And for me, I, I describe it as it allows the. Um, the pagan classical world to be bioavailable to, to moderns because you can kind of see the. Uh, if you look at something like the Greek magical papyri, which obviously everyone loves, but it's 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 a mess because it's a collation of you know yeah. one wizard's kind of spells essentially. You see, the Hegromanti is messy as well, but it's just messy enough so that you get the shape of it, which, as you say, is the authority piece that I think is a, a structural piece that's retained in the grimoires, and then people as- associate it you know, in the 17th century with actual God and, you know, saying this and Jesus and, and having that kind of very Christian structure. But the shape, I think, is quite important and being able to um, get the pass keys of kind of like seniority, I call it like access to the business lounge, um, either through the planets or what have you. And I don't even really care what structure people use as long as it I mean, as long as it works, but I like you can, there's a sort of, you know, uh, the Office of the Spirits for Kings model, there's there's any of these ways that as long as you're kind of getting the structure right, but Higromantia for me, because I think you're like getting the attention of the planets kind of covers uh, a lot of what falls underneath it. And there's some really fun, messy, short things you can do that are in the Higromantia that aren't elsewhere, the bold divinations and that kind of stuff that I, um, I think it's fun. I think it's, uh, it gives you enough structure and enough flexibility. Yeah. I think that's the beginning of, of it coalescing into, mm. into a set of practices. I think so. Like I, I, but to be honest, I'm less fond of the papyri than I should be. I think that being involved in witchcraft tends to ruin your vision of the papyri. And I have to say, 
uh, it's because you start to realize that there's a lot of things that have to do with ingress having to be done first. And a lot of things in the papyri do seem like that. They do seem like the kind of practice that would re- would work if you had been like, received or being initiated in a certain temple. Because, I mean, it's not the initiation in the sense of the physical gestures that a person is going to do in front of you. It's the receiving of a spirit and the yep. license to operate with them. That is the crucial part of it. And that is actually at the heart of what I believe to be witchcraft. And um, so looking at the papyri, I'm less fond than I should be. There are certain rites of the papyri that I actually think are really key and, and connect well with the grimoire structure. But I don't think, by and large, I don't think it's that useful. But, okay, now I said it. But, <laughs> well, I, that's why I said bioavailable, because I, I broadly yeah. agree with that. I think there is about five or six things in the um, the sort of bets uh, PGM that you can pick up and run with on day one, right? Yeah. Uh, the rest of it is historically useful for providing context to the bits sure. that are maybe more available to you in in a, in a grimoire sense. Because in that, I mean, a, you know, profound history nerd, so so I like it on that level. Yeah. But I, I agree, there's not that many that you can pick up straight away and run with. Uh, and I think there's obviously, I think there's evidence supporting, um, some of them. That's interesting. And I'm glad it's Hygromantia because, uh, the, the next question would be, so you have a very, from a, uh, from an Anglo spirit perspective, you had a very, very interesting, uh, experience of the spirit world so far, um, with growing up in Brazil and, uh, and, and running sounds in a hotel and then having, having time being a boring Australian and then coming back to it. Uh, so this gives you the perspective, this gives you an interesting perspective on what engagement with the spirit world looks like, dare I say, when it's real and some of the shortcomings of how people either experience it or discuss it today. So what are the things that, what do you, what do you think are the biggest shortcomings for, um, and how do we overcome them what are the biggest shortcomings and sort of problem areas that need to be looked at in kind of sort of contemporary magical practice today yeah um i think there's um i tend to be have a casual relationship with the culture philosophy in general and mostly because i can't avoid going back to the experiences at all times and then compare contrasting the experiences with with the philosophy that i read and especially agrippa like agrippa has he talks about so many things, and but then again, he is so adamantly against a lot of things that grimoirists do, right? And even though they get mentioned in tandem, I don't think it's you know it, it's complicated. I think the relationship is more complicated than it seems. I think that now to answer your question, I, I, I try to set up set that up. Um, I think that people should write more manuscripts on magic, and I think we can do better now than the grimoires and the people who wrote Solomonic manuscripts 500 years ago did. And I say so because we have the benefit of being, in general, more educated than they were. We can tell from the dog Latin and whatnot that they were not exactly that. And I think we can, we, we're not being persecuted. Yeah. Or I mean, at least in the Western world, for the most part, it's true. And I think... Yeah, I think in general that's what we should do. But then again, I'm saying that to you, and a lot of people have done exactly that. And you know how problematic it is. I think that the roots of the tradition are really important because they are adamant about the encounters of the spirits having to be real and having to be that spirit that when you get, then you need to understand who they are. You need to have a conversation with them. And I believe that that kind of ritual is really difficult to do. I believe that it's going to take the average person a good few years to nail that. To nail in a repeated way, in a repeatable way. So yeah. I, I think that I think that's I call it LARPing. Uh, what what frustrates me about the Anglosphere at the moment is when you look at something like Agrippa or um, the Grimoires. I think we are taking too literally the wrong parts of it. So uh, uh, and you're right because they don't they they've got their understanding of the world provably wrong. The, the, the um, Agrippa is a good example of it. Everyone has to read him. He's, he's important. But yeah. I think we focus today uh, on, uh, we take too literally the wrong parts of Agrippa, because as you just said, there is um, the underlying piece, which is, uh, which you find in all the grimoires is you have to get, if you're after this spirit, you have to get this spirit and you have to get it to talk to you. That's actually the piece that 
is important, not all the other stuff about how he describes, you know, the world and so on. But we, we've kind of pulled the wrong bit. And I think it's LARPing. I think it's live action role playing because um, I, too many people and I, I love history, obviously. Um, so it's it's not that it's too many people are kind of like the smell of history like they're like the incense of of the robes and 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 the sort of drama of it rather than and that's the piece that i think we focus too literally on rather than the actual bit that's underneath it that they're all trying to describe from uh well not kind of it's implied in the testament of solomon but from the higromantia on what they are describing is that is a set of protocols for spirit contact and that's the bit yeah, no, the cosmology is not even complete, if you think about it. I mean, they pretty much assume that you would be religious, that you would understand that there are demons and there's God up there and angels and planets. And that's full stop, right? Go and do the mm-hmm. thing. Like, and, and going back a bit to spiritism and, and the other Brazilian practices, if you go back there, you'll be, you hardly find somebody equipped with that kind of cosmology. Like, you're not going to. Like, mm-hmm. it's what's going to happen is... Like you attend, I, I may have said it on Facebook even that what happens there is people attend repeatedly to the to the events and they get invited in and then they find out they have an ability and then they work that ability until the spirit contact or a spirit or perhaps a bunch takes over the situation and then uses you to deliver their message and to and so on and then that's they're the ones that are going to tell you okay, the, you know, when you die, this so-and-so is going to happen, and there's this guy, there's that guy, and so on. That's, what's, that, that's exactly how it goes. And then that's their cosmology. That's the end of it. Nobody read Agrippa. And I'm not saying not, don't read Agrippa. I'm just, saying yeah. That, yeah. I'm just saying that it's important to recognize that there are practices that live outside of that. Yes. And that, you know, and, and, and we, need to pay, like, we need to pay attention to that before we dismiss things as not being matching to this set of disciplines that we believe here. Remember, there are things that thrive and live outside. And it's actually really funny when you see practitioners or people interested in ATRs uh, castigating the absence of that philosophy. And I'm going, but, but have you actually seen? Have you seen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they haven't, they haven't even heard of it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and that's exactly, they, they're taking the, you know, they're pulling the wrong bits and focusing on it and, and ignoring the right bits. And, and it, it's pulling up an absurd philosophy. I do, I mean, Agrippa is important, but he's overemphasized. He's overemphasized because he has this long historical shadow, which is for a while there, he was almost acceptable to quote as, as, as a medical authority and, and, and so on. So when it came to the 19th century magical revival, um, you, you have a kind of, couple of hundred years of people saying well Agrippa said this and he was really wise so it's it's kind of warped the the view today of of his validity when there is in fact about really not even that many there's maybe like eight or nine grimoires from the Higromantia uh up to oh gosh maybe the long lost friend uh that you you kind of need to read to get a shape of across time of what exactly what you're talking about which is this is archaeological or, or textual evidence that there was a spirit tradition beside it don't pay attention to their ridiculous <laughs> broken yeah. cosmology in the middle i think though that 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 gets done because i mean if people choose to let that kind of philosophy guide what is real for them then what you end up doing is then if you actually get to the point that you're doing experience and having experiences then you got to match the experiences back to philosophy, right? And I mean, fine, if that's what you want to do, right? But it's it's definitely not, again, like I said, it, there, there are cults that don't work like that at all. Mm. I, I frankly tend to side with them a lot more because I'm more pragmatic than that. I, th- I tend to want to find the realness behind any experience. And then if, and if that happens, then okay, then we have business. Otherwise, I, I don't really care. I don't care yeah. how pretty it is. Your poetry, <laughs> yeah. I still will go. Oh, that's nice, but you know, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, um, th- I, I that you kind of make a good point, which is it, it doesn't matter. I don't really care if if people are doing it. It's the same thing. The bit that frustrates me, or well, no, it frustrates even too strong a word. What I would like to see is the recognition that that um, sort of. Uh, 19th century model is a subset of the real thing rather than the real thing being a subset of it. So you have you have the same thing happening with um, Levy and 
Uh, what happened in, in kind of 19th century France in particular is that they pulled all this um, pseudo-Egyptian mysticism together and that's where we get the tarot cards and that's where we get Kardec and Levy and all this and kind of invented the idea that it's this grand tradition and you need the, the Kabbalah and it all hangs together and it's, it's essentially the new age of, of the 19th century yeah. and that's fine and it's legitimate as long as you recognize it's a subset of magic rather than magic being a subset of that worldview and then you guys can people who are interested in it can go off and and and, and have their tree of life fun but that's where <laughs> yeah one is a subset I think of the ma other. magic is a magic is a science of bastards really I think like you end up finding People who actually have talent at the same time that they say, say 50% of what they say is valid and useful. The other 50% is baggage. And then, but, but that's how it goes, right? I mean, you yeah. can hardly disassociate one thing from the other. And I, I, I think it's, it's part of learning how to do it is you learning to navigate that. And it, I, I find though that social media tends to be a space where the baggage tends to count for more, mm. which is why you get, Tumblr's of gifts, what, whatever are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. So that's why that happens. It's because the baggage tends to be the bigger, like the bigger chunk of it, and people are uh, they're all the time responding to to people imprinting their baggage and their beliefs that they haven't necessarily tested onto any given subject, but doing doing so again, like the old grimoires, doing so very adamantly. And then it, it sounds as if they know what they're talking about, but it may not be the case from a point of view of experience, at least. I think Pete Carroll said an idea can pass from book to book without any intervening thought. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that would be baggage. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, does that mean, does that mean, because you know how I feel about um, Facebook in general, although I still think I can stomach Twitter for the next year or so. Uh, is it a good thing? Like, uh, is is it just a tool that's being improperly used? Is it messing with stuff? Is is there a possibility we can? Uh, is it positive from the perspective of growing this magical renaissance in in an authentic way and and having that magical renaissance prioritize the real over the baggage? Look, I think it can be positive. I just I just think that anything that becomes popular becomes shit. By definition, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, perhaps, except for the Woodstock, but but you know, I think a lot of things that get get popular, they get they deteriorate because the discussions end up being about the the majority that hasn't done it, mm. which is crucial to this. But uh, however, I think even Facebook is to me is not too bad. Like if you curate the space, you're fine, right? But but then you're gonna find people who are willing to, and and that will carry that torch and not let it deteriorate. So there are a few groups that I'm in that are actually good, but there are very few. Like I'm, 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 when I say few, I'm saying two or three. Mm. And everything else is the thing of, look, every now and then I have a look, and then it, there's about 15 threads of garbage for two things that are probably valid questions. But look, I'm in trying to answer the question. I think, yeah, it can be good. And I think it's inevitable. Like that's the space that we communicate. And you bet that the next 50 years of magic will have everything to do with that. Because I think so. again, it, because again, it's inevitable and it's just how it goes. And, but it's, it's up to us to make it good. Like I think so far it's been all right because I think I stick to the right circles. But, but yeah, the, the more public space is always going to, it's going to stay hopeless forever. Well, you mentioned something which um, kind of ties into the next question, which is the next 50 years. Uh, what, because I kind of, oh, inevitably, because it's Australia and so on, I, I, I obviously didn't have um, the same volume of um, seance experiences and so on, although there were few. Mother did automatic writing and I, I did kind of, although I didn't lose friends over it, had my own kind of high, high school seances. <laughs> um what are the pieces that we would want people to pick up and use from this magical renaissance in a hundred years time? Like what we did, what everyone did from the sort of, you know, um, 80s on after the, the last few sort of remnants of the 19th century had died and it was kind of turning around and picking up those pieces. You mentioned the next 50 years. And it's almost a question of, and this is actually going to be um, one of the last questions. Is there anything, if you could time travel back to 12 year old Julio, 
setting up for that seance, is there anything that you would kind of go, mm, do these things differently? <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's, you well, see how it's the same question? Like, I want to see, I, I think 100 years is too long to pull the value out of the 19th century Renaissance. So I want to know what pieces are valuable now in a hundred years time. And it's kind of that question of what are the things and it, it's a beginner's question. What should people focus on? Because we've discussed before, I still get questions like, what do you think of the left-hand path? And I'm like, oh, it's really <laughs> this discussion, are we? And that's, we have an opportunity to never have that discussion again in a hundred years time. <laughs> so that's it. It's a big sort of open question. What are the bits we'd like to retain from this Renaissance in a hundred years time? Um, I think it's immersion. I, I believe that you spirit contact, which is at the center of nearly all magic. I mean, there, there's, you know, there are magic that's more oriented to spells and getting certain things in particular. But, but I believe when it comes to spirit contact, it has to be immersion and it has to be, it has to be tangible. I think that if there's anything that the grimoire tradition left us is that, like in, it's their adamancy about how important that is and how easily it is to be fooled and it is like i find that to be very true like it is very easy to be fooled by whatever happens there and you gotta be thorough and when i say immersion i also mean commitment and i think that you can't do magic of that caliber as a hobbyist mm. i think you can do a lot of magic as a hobbyist but i don't think you can do that kind of magic as a hobbyist and i think people need to be aware of that i think that the recent the recent wave of teachers and writers trying to find a niche in the space, they kind of kick that in the nuts. And then I kick them in the nuts back with that Tumblr. But that was the rationale behind it, actually, because I found that if you tr if you go and take spirit magic and you try to turn into this sort of thing that's more like a toss a coin in the fountain and you get a wish, you're fucked. Like yeah. it's, you're not going to get anywhere. That's going to be a, way, a huge waste of time and, a, and an expensive one at that. So, so no, I believe that immersion is the thing. I believe that I, I'm not attached necessarily to a discipline in particular or magic. I believe that whatever you do can be given depth or almost anything, but, but it can be given depth. And if you do, do give that depth and you do give the time and you do actually invest in making the rights profound, deep and give them the time to happen, then it will be amazing. But I think that's it. I think immersion is the thing. And I think immersion is sort of at the core of Grimoire Magic, which is important. Yeah, I, I I think that's an excellent reading of both the priorities and and the history, because I uh, that that sort of famous story of um, uh, Crowley when he's still in the Golden Dawn being told, well, then little brother the Goetia is me messing with you. Uh, the nineteenth century built because it was competing with things like spiritualism. It it built a renaissance around the idea of never doing spirit contact and instead hanging out in temples doing a, like a, a an invented egyptian version of freemasonry uh so they, they actually left the real thing at the door and if you wanted to kind of build that into a structure today when you talk about immersion it's almost like you would want the beginner to go and make some hopefully relatively benign mistakes with an ouija board to know that it is it is kind of real and also maybe i'm a little bit out of my depth and 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 kind of take it to that that level of um, spirit encounter back, spirit encounter back, uh, and and sort of find it because it it seems to me that people should, if if you were to if you were to start a pseudo, uh, a pseudo Masonic order today, you would want it to be based on um, demonstrable spirit world contact at each exactly. level beginning and so you can say well welcome to day one here's your ouija board um here's a one page printout about how to do some automatic writing don't come back until the automatic writing comes true <laughs> no it, that's yeah. exactly it and that's one of the reasons why uh, we discussed this book you and i on on twitter um it was coming in with spirits and um yes. and, and and what the book says is basically that it says look don't don't bother with the rest until you can do that and it's true like i, I found when i read that book and i read that i went oh shit this guy got it like he really <laughs> you know he really got it because it, it is it's real like i think you, you would be doing everybody a disservice if you told him to do anything else because it leads to that kind of thing it leads to people trying to retrofit uh, experiences in philosophy later and it's the worst way to go about it like you can have the experiences if you persist and you work on it but you gotta work on it you can't you can't get hung up on that kind of thing i mean th th there are parts of the world that don't like you i don't see why you should no agreed agreed well julio you, you mentioned the tumblr where else 
because this has been a fascinating conversation, and I think we've landed on a couple of book re- recommendations. The uh, mysterious slash pseudonymous, uh, pseudonymous Mr. Coleman's Communion with the Spirits, and obviously the Hygromantia. Uh, we, we know of a certain Tumblr blog. Where else might people find you? Uh, oh, there's Facebook. I do post magical stuff on my Facebook timeline. I'm trying really hard not to post politics there. <laughs> so I uh, try really, really hard. Uh, you want to talk but, about politics? You got to get yourself a newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, less drama. But, mm, okay, yeah. So long as I don't hear back anything, yeah. <laughs> that's the key. Yeah, don't read the comment section. It's the mantra. Yeah. Right? But yeah, no. I well, there's Crossing Sun, which is a blog that I run on Tumblr as well, and mm-hmm. there's the funny Tumblr. But the there funny is. Tumblr is not meant to be informative. It's it's meant to be informative. <laughs> it's that, it's, you know, I actually found it amongst the list of very informative URLs. So there was like blogs of really important people in the occult, and then Social Magic Reactions was in the middle. I just went, shit, that's not, <laughs> you're doing it wrong. That's not, that's not it. <laughs> All right, well, that's a Tumblr post right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. But no, I, I write, I, I do my magical essays on that blog, the other Tumblr, and... Uh, there are a few things that I may still write on it, but I have been sort of going through a different phase now. So I'm kind of working on that until I go back to writing more about magic. But I did drop my, my current phase of practices and an approach to spirit work. It's there. It's an essay there. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll have that all up in the show notes. And uh, this is, you know, this has been really pleasant. We're in the same time zone, so we haven't had to have conversations about weather and it's not 5 a.m. And yeah. uh, so it's been a fantastic conversation, Julio. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. You know, I was thinking as I was editing this that if you got your head around the history of the tarot that Michael and I were talking about in the previous episode, the same historical shape applies to what Julia was saying about the difference between philosophy and practice or immersion. So I thought I'd just open with that get it down somewhere before I uh, before I forgot it. Speaking of forgetting, uh, who could possibly forget some of our other discussion topics? Brazil, spiritism, childhood seances, grimoires, all very good times. For more good times, you know the ones I mean, head over to RuneSoup and subscribe to the blog or newsletter. Uh, let me know what you think of the show at the RuneSoup Facebook page and or find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-I-D-O-N, underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>